Right, so if you thought we'd moved on from that little mess of an SNP ceasefire motion back in February, where on their opposition day they ended up having their own motion hijacked by Labour, with help from the weakling Speaker of the House of Commons, Lindsay Hoyle, to push through a Labour amendment instead. Something which, in the case of an opposition day debate, was against the standing orders, the established rules of the House of Commons. With attempts to get Starmer referred to the Privileges Committee for investigation over this having been blocked, conveniently for Hoyle, by his deputy speakers, it's very much looked like Starmer had got away with whatever he had said to Hoyle to get him to set aside the standing orders, blocking that Labour amendment on the SNP motion. A motion which looked likely to cause a massive rebellion amongst Labour backbenchers, so it was all very convenient, and likely more resignations from his front bench to boot. Well, it seems the story isn't over yet, as another attempt to bring Starmer and Hoyle to book for what happened here is in the offing. And in the interest of democracy, we really do need to know what Starmer did and why Hoyle capitulated to break the rules here as he did. Because nobody was buying his Islamophobic excuse to get himself off the hook here either. Right, so, ceasefire gate. It's back on. It's not over yet, folks. As allegations of intimidation in Parliament simply cannot be allowed to be gotten away with. Now, I'm sure the bit you all remember that stuck in the mind of many people when all this happened with the chaos in Parliament that occurred as the SNP and the Tories marching out of the Commons Chamber on that SNP opposition day back on the 21st of February after Labour were allowed to bring an amendment to that SNP ceasefire motion. On their day, it was SNP opposition day. The convention on opposition days is that where typically amendments to any motion are heard and voted on first, that isn't the case here. The opposition party in question, being their day, brings the motion first, so it can then be amended after if needs be, if the amendment that is selected passes. Now the government, if they lay down an amendment on an opposition day, that supersedes all other amendments and theirs is always taken. And this was the case here. The Tories had laid one down, which meant Labour's amendment, being another opposition party, should never have been heard since the standing order only allows for one amendment to come after the main motion. By Hoyle allowing Labour's amendment as well, it therefore had to be heard, in which case before the SNP motion, which effectively then hijacks their opposition day. It's the whole point of the standing order being in place. And the only reason Starmer had to do this was because he faced a massive rebellion on his back benches, plus likely more front bench resignations, and an SNP ceasefire amendment from back in November saw Starmer lose 10 front benches as it was, and this one was tipped to be a lot bigger. Fundamentally, if Starmer's obeisance to Israel wasn't so hardened and nailed on, and he was capable of holding them to account for their genocidal actions, he wouldn't have ever been in the mess he was in. But rather than accept he's in the wrong there, because he appears to have a complete incapability of acknowledging fault personally, instead the allegation is that Starmer ended up coercing the Speaker, Lindsay Hoyle, apparently threatening him with Labour support being taken away from advocating for Hoyle to return as Speaker after the next general election. Obviously, with Labour looking at a ridiculously massive majority on paper as they are right now, Hoyle would be screwed if he wanted his precious Speaker role back. It appears to have worked, in which case. Hoyle allowed the motion to absolute uproar. Starmer was seen to say thank you to him as he left the chamber. Job done, it seemed. Hoyle claimed to want the widest possible debate as his reasoning for allowing that Labour amendment before scuttling off himself and leaving his one of his deputies to oversee the following proceedings and the, the fallout. He later got dragged back though, made a statement claiming that there had been credible threats against MPs and he didn't want to see another MP murdered was the implication, implying there was some kind of Islamic terrorist plot behind all of this, which he hadn't brought up before when he decided to set aside the standing order, and for which no evidence has been publicly produced since. Again, there was uproar. As on the face of it, the Speaker had resorted to racism to cover his own backside. Starmer was referred to the Privileges Committee by Alba Party MP Neil Hanvey over these allegations of coercion, but this fell apart when, ultimately, it fell to the Speaker to decide if such a vote on this would take place. Now, Hoyle recused himself, being involved as he was, and left it to his loyal deputies to make this decision, who, by deciding against an investigation unanimously, protected their boss. They were hardly... The impartial group needed to decide upon this, surely. Th that, we thought, was the end of the story then, in which case it would appear that Starmer had got away with it again. Hoyle continues to squat in the Speaker's role, despite it being clear to everyone in the Commons and publicly who have been paying attention to this story that he is far too weak to fulfil the role and 
command the respect of the House of Commons. A no confidence motion in Hoyle that was doing the rounds and attracted many signatures backed that up. Both Starmer and Hoyle's positions appeared to be untenable, yet they appeared to have got away with it at the end of the day. Or had they? Because that appeared to be the case until now. Ultimately, where moves to investigate Starmer and Hoyle had failed previously were because the Deputy Speakers blocked a debate and a vote on referral to the Privileges Committee in the House of Commons. But now there could be a vote anyway. You see, the Deputy Speaker's collective decision on this can be overridden with a fresh motion which could be about to be brought to Parliament. A motion which is seeing the SNP, who got completely shafted, as you can appreciate, prepared to work with Tory backbenchers of all people, including the executive of the 1922 Committee of Tory backbenchers, no less, who have an awful lot of influence, and most importantly, arguably, they appear to have the support of the leader of the House of Commons, Penny Mordaunt, who controls parliamentary time. So if she wants this heard, and she regularly attacks Starmer as unfit to lead and being weak, certainly sentiments I've carried on this channel, and I'm certainly no Tory, very much the opposite. But when it comes to what Starmer and Hoyle have done here, this is simply right versus wrong. We do not know what was said by Starmer to Hoyle, and we know he said something because he admitted as much. And it has some bearing on Hoyle doing what he did after, which screwed up a ceasefire vote, which the people of this country wanted to see happen, wanted to see an end to UK support for a genocidal state as Israel is widely seen to be, and already was seen to be at that time. So, Morden can make time for this vote in which case. And with the SNP and Tories both in support of this vote happening, it's likely to pass if it does. Labour certainly don't have the numbers to stop it. The Rishi Sunak in this picture could get himself off any hook here by allowing this to be a free vote amongst his MPs. But it wouldn't make any difference to the result, and you can imagine he wouldn't be sorry to see Starmer being made to squirm. It would leave Starmer facing an investigation into his own conduct, his honesty and integrity, with all the lies that could be attributed to him already over the past several years, all going into an election campaign. Now, from a purely self-serving Tory standpoint, you can understand this is an opportunity in their case to try and save some of their own backsides, giving them another target to throw at Labour and this will be something that will give Starmer grief throughout the election campaign because it won't be a, a quick solve. But to what extent it will make a difference, we would just have to wait and see. It wouldn't be a positive for Labour in any way, shape or form, though. Tory self-interest aside, from the SNP standpoint, this would be about upholding democracy and that every constituent across the UK makes sure they are equally represented because SNP voters, those with an SNP MP, a representative, got treated as secondary to Labour's concerns on this matter of a ceasefire in Gaza. And that is a huge issue that matters massively, or should matter massively, to ordinary people around the UK, because that is not being reflected in Parliament. Some MPs, well, some parties, their words appear to carry more weight than others, and that cannot be allowed to stand, that cannot be allowed to be the case. The SNP and the Tories absolutely hate each other, even if historically at times they've been politically a lot closer. Some Labour Starmerites are coming out with the old Tartan Tories mantra, and that, that's doing the rounds again on social media. But they haven't really been that for a long time. They're prepared to work with the Tories, though both parties likely have very different reasons for wanting to see this investigation happen, to ensure this investigation happens. And regardless of their motivations, it is important from a democracy standpoint and from ordinary people's standpoint that Parliament does represent them, that this does happen. If Starmer is capable of subverting the House by having the Speaker essentially in his pocket and any time he chooses, that could be catastrophic for the country, especially if he gets into power now, as is looking likely, but with Hoyle still in place as well. We need a strong Speaker that will hold the, the House of Commons to account, not be in the pocket of one party over all others. We need to know what happened here, in which case. We need to know if there really was coercion and misconduct here, and if that is proven by an investigation by the Privileges Committee once given the nod to investigate, the parties involved must be held to account and censured for it properly. It needs to be instigated before the election because with Labour looking at getting a massive majority, which will affect the makeup of all parliamentary committees, putting more Labour faces on them, the harder it will be to do this should Starmer become PM, we then face the prospect of arguably one of the most anti-democratic and authoritarian prime ministers we've ever seen, almost certainly being put beyond reproach at that point by the sheer weight of numbers of MPs that he will have. If Starmer and Hoyle thought they'd got away with this, they need to be proven wrong, and it needs to happen this side of that general election. They need to be subjected to an investigation here 
that they can't stop. And as much as I fixed on Starmer for most of this, Hoyle is no less deserving of investigation himself either, especially since he did the most gut-wrenching thing of all, which was to resort to Islamophobia to save himself, as this video recommendation will perhaps refresh your memory on or inform if this aspect of this parliamentary mess passed you by. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next bit. Cheers, folks.